and don't. All right, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful Sunday evening in the collapse of everything. We are halfway through the month of September, one of the most beautiful months of my life. It is now Sunday evening, September 15th, 2024, and the little dog and I are having a mouse war and waiting for that beautiful moonrise to come over the mountain, uh, which should be here hopefully right about the time I finish today's Chronicle of the Collapse. You know, guys, it has been way too long since I have checked in with one of my uh, Collapsitarian heroes. That is Robert Jensen. He is a retired journalism professor from the uh, University of Texas and good old Austin, Texas. I have had the great pleasure of interviewing Robert Jensen three times and uh, maybe it's time to bring Robert back for a fourth interview but while I figure all that out uh, I need to I just kinda his his website uh, Robert W. Jensen, J-E-N-S-E-N, -E -E no relation to Derek, uh, Robert W. Jensen dot org, and you will find, uh, good Lord, how many uh, articles and essays written by one of the great voices from the, uh, from the Doomosphere. Not sure Robert uh, calls himself completely a doomer, although most people probably would. But anyway, we're going to dive into his fantastic website. You need to get that mousy. That mousy. That mousy. You need to go get, while I'm doing this, you need to go get that mousy. Right? Did you see the mousy? You hear the mousy or not? That mousy. like that. All right, while well, Sancho is getting the mousy, but no barking, uh, we are going to check in uh, with Robert Jensen. This came out, it was published in Population Balance. I need to find out what Population Balance is. Uh, last month, in August of 2024, this is what was on Robert's mind. Population. The fear of limiting people and our things. The fear of limiting people. Take it away, Robert. <clears throat> Here's a question almost no one wants to talk about. What is the sustainable size of the human population at what level of aggregate consumption? Why are so many people afraid to discuss something so essential? Because the question suggests we need to impose limits on ourselves, something modern societies are not good at, and most people do not want to consider. No one has a definitive answer, of course, about the number of people or our things that would make possible a decent human future. Well, I'm just going to interject. I am, I, I am on record. I have not quite gotten Robert to come over to the near-term human extinction movement uh, where the uh, the sustainable size of the human population for all of our non-human fellow earthlings is zero. So do understand Robert Jensen is not yet anyway a member of the uh, near-term human extinction uh, I'm sorry the voluntary human extinction movement. Anyway <clears throat> 
No one has a definitive answer, of course, about the number of people or our things that would make possible a decent human future. But given the multiple cascading ecological crises we face, it would be prudent to assume that we should move in the direction of fewer and less. Fewer people consuming a lot less. That conclusion seems obvious to me today. The qualifier today reminds me of how easy it is for all of us to avoid harsh realities. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a friend about why so many people on the left side of the fence my political home, you know, Robert Jensen is a hardcore, dyed-in-the-wool, old-school lefty. He is not a limp-dick lefty. When I talk about the term limp-dick lefty, I assure you I am not talking about Robert Jensen. Why so many people on the left side of the fence refuse to acknowledge that imposing limits is necessary. Standard left dogma is that the problem is not population and consumption, but capitalism. If the world's resources were distributed equitably, there would be enough for everyone. This dodgy, it's economics, not pomp, Popula this dodge, its economics, not population and consumption, is a serious deficiency of left analysis, I told my friend, because it avoids coming to terms with the biophysical limits of the larger living world of which we are but one part. Brief, uncomfortable pause. When I asked you about population a long time ago, my friend said, you told me that it was not important. Your answer was that the problem was capitalism. You gave me what you are now calling left dogma. Another brief, uncomfortable pause. I had two possible responses. I could construct some tortured explanation of how many past comments were more nuanced and that what I had really meant was I spared us both that torture and agreed. Yes, I said, you are absolutely right. For a long time, I repeated that dogma even though I was never sure it made sense. I did not challenge the claim because I had not read widely enough or spent enough time thinking about the question, in other words, 10 or 15 seconds. <clears throat> so <coughs> I said what people of my political leanings were supposed to say and obviously, guys, he's not even talking about people on the right uh, who, who obviously are, are, are a lot more in overpopulation denial than the limp dick lefties. I stuck with the herd. I wanted to be seen as a good leftist, and that was lazy. Reasonable people can disagree about the issue, but accepting dogma to avoid critical thinking is bad intellectual practice and contributes to bad public policy. In other words, I may be wrong about my conclusion today, but I definitely was wrong simply to repeat the party line for so long. Here is how I think about these questions today. <clears throat> First,
first concern about what are typically called environmental problems is widespread, of course, but rather than focus on specific threats such as rapid climate destabilization, we should recognize that any single ecological crisis is a derivative of overshoot. Too many people consuming too much in the aggregate. The highly skewed distribution of wealth is morally unacceptable, but as a species, we are living collectively beyond the carrying capacity of the ecosphere. Okay, here we go again. Uh, Robert, I'm a little bit embarrassed for you going here, but since you're going to go here, I'm going to go here too. Here's a simple timeline from li my life to help us grasp the scale. My father was born in 1927 when the world population was 2 billion. In 1974, the midpoint of his life, we hit 4 billion. When he died at the end of 22, the world population was 8 billion. In one person's lifetime, just three generations, the world population doubled and doubled again. That is unprecedented as was the increase in energy consumption. In the 20th century, the average annual per capita supply of commercial energy per capita more than quadrupled. That consumption also is marked by inequality. At the end of the 20th century, 10% of the world's population consumed more than 40% of commercial primary energy, and the bottom 50% of the population had access to about 10% of the energy. Also unprecedented are the effects on the ecosphere of all those people consuming all that energy. Virtually every ecosystem on Earth has been degraded by this level of human habitation. The 2019 UN report shows that three quarters of the land-based environment and two-thirds of the marine environment have been significantly altered by human actions. Such studies now appear regularly in the news. A crossroads for humanity, Earth's biodiversity is still collapsing, described a 2020 report from the UN Convention on Biodiversity that reminds us species extinction is not only unfortunate for the species that go extinct, but also threatens humanity's food supply, health, and security. A study published the following year concluded that only 3% of the land surface is faunally intact, meaning uh, I think what faunally intact means, you know, having the biodiversity that it should have if humans had never evolved, I think is a pretty good definition of that. Politics and economics have yet to adapt to this. In 2022, a respected think tank warned that to prevent the collapse of biodiversity, the world needs a new planetary politics even if one's focus is on the economic bottom line, such as the folks at the World Economic Forum in 2023, it's hard not to notice, quote, terrestrial and marine ecosystems are facing multiple pressure points 
due to their undervalued contribution to the global economy as well as overall planetary health. And of course, if you breathe the the words the the uh, World Economic Forum, uh, good Lord, uh, we're we're not, we're not going to get off on that uh, that bunch of weirdos. <clears throat> the rate of population growth is the rate of population growth is slowing due in large part to advances in the status of women and education of girls, but growth is predicted through this century peaking at perhaps 10 billion, nobody knows. Slowly, slowly slowing growth is of little comfort, even if we were to reduce per capita consumption worldwide, especially in affluent countries, ain't gonna happen. All three population scenarios pose problems. So here are the big three scenarios. Number one, a growing global population poses serious challenges for humanity by intensifying the consequences of overshoot. That means greater social instability and more rapid ecological degradation. Scenario number two, a stable global population, assuming I guess talking a stable population of 8 billion, a stable global population poses serious challenges for humanity since we are already in overshoot. That means at the very least existing levels of social instability and ecological degradation can be expected to continue. And scenario number three, a shrinking global population poses serious challenges for humanity given that the world economy is built on overshoot. Thank you, Robert, that uh, the, anyway, we don't need to go blasting off there. By the 2020 by the 2020s, politicians routinely were raising alarms about how falling birth rates in affluent societies raise the elderly dependency ratio. The ratio of working people to older folks, a high dependency ratio, means that fewer young people carry a heavier burden to support those who are not economically active. Slowing population growth risks the economic growth on which virtually all of the world economy is based. Even China, once the country working hardest to restrict births, is concerned. Many of my friends and allies in progressive movements reject any concerns about population, dismissing them as neo-Malthusian, as if Thomas Malthus's inaccurate predictions about food production in the 19th century mean we need not worry about the question today. Many on the left, and, I, and of course everybody on the right is implied in this, many on the left avoid the question because of the racist and ethnocentric ideologies that have been associated with concerns about overpopulation in the past. Well, maybe I spoke too soon about those right-wingers. Defined, I guess, by lefties as, quote, a kind of environmentalism that advocates violence 
or the exclusion of some groups of people due to their race or class or both, close quote. That does not mean there is no overpopulation problem, only that we must be careful to avoid bad analysis and ugly politics, a task in which population balance is leading the way. The problem of too many humans should not be blamed on poor or non-white people in the developing world. Well, I, I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to have to butt in here, Robert. Uh, even though I am a lefty too, uh, a, a, as a matter of fact, in those countries, uh, yes, it should be blamed on the poor or, or non-white people in the developing world for not keeping their damn peckers in their pants. But anyway, this is Robert's rant, not mine. So even Robert Jensen is, is caving in a little bit to the lefties. It is a problem, overpopulation is a problem created by the trajectory of human history, the result of our ability to get at more and more energy-rich carbon with new technologies leading to ecological degradation resulting from too many people consuming too much overall. No one can pull off the shelf a quick and easy plan to reduce human aggregate consumption by reducing our numbers. I don't know, I think there's nine nuclear powers now. Uh, I think there's at least nine people on the planet who could uh, pretty quickly uh, get to work on that. Anyway, no one can pull off the shelf a quick and easy plan to reduce human aggregate consumption by reducing our numbers our appetites or both, but the fact that we do not know how to impose limits on ourselves does not mean we don't have to do it. And the only way to come up with a plan is to stop avoiding the issue. The uh, voluntary human extinction movement has a very simple plan, takes about 20 minutes, okay? It's called snip, snip, tie, tie. I have a plan. Uh, voluntary human extinction movement has a plan, all right? But as I say, Robert's not quite white ready to go into uh, the uh, even Robert's not going to to stick his uh, little toe there don't know if Robert uh, Jensen is a breeder or not I don't think he is Gloria Nanati could you please find out whether Robert Jensen is a breeder now I know he's married to a breeder, but uh, does that count or not? Anyway, I need to wrap this up because here comes the moon coming over the mountain. And I want to, the little dog says he wants to go to bed. Sancho, where are you? Sancho. What are you doing? How did you get on the bed? Okay, this little dog ha has been telling me for, uh, th this little dog, he, he, you understand, basically has three legs. He wanted me to put him to bed. This dog, for 10 years, a a has been getting me to lift him up on this bed. It, it so... I, I see that you've been lying to me uh, for 10 years, 8 years, acting like you're not able to jump up on this bed. Can you see this 
this little dog. You don't look like you have any interest in uh, looking at the, what do you guys think? Does this little dog look like he's interested in watching the moon rise? Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to head out and watch this gorgeous moon rise on this beautiful September night in the collapse of everything while I still can. My guys.